Hey there, I'm Sue Searles, standing in front of Lee's Pond in Brewster, Massachusetts, and I would like to welcome you to the Brewster Ponds Coalition's virtual pond trip. We are located on Cape Cod, which has about 1,000 freshwater kettle ponds that were formed long ago by retreating glaciers. As you look at the map of Cape Cod, you can see just how many ponds there are. We call them ponds, but many are actually large enough to be called lakes. Here in Brewster, we have more than 80 ponds. Ponds are beautiful to look at, provide many fun recreational activities, and are also ecosystems, providing homes to a wide variety of plants and animals. But did you know that there are animals in the pond who can tell us something about the pond's health? Yes, there are. And if you would like to learn more, stay tuned. Hi, I'm Doug Smith, a naturalist and a volunteer with the Brewster Ponds Coalition. I'm here today with you at Greenland Pond, one of the many ponds in Brewster. And uh, I'll talk, be talking to you a little bit more later about some of the critters here in this ecosystem. Hi, I'm Jan McGann and I'm at Blueberry Pond in Brewster, Mass. Sue mentioned that ponds are ecosystems. But what's an ecosystem? Eco means home or habitat and a system has many parts that work together. So an ecosystem is a community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. Things look pretty quiet at the moment, but under the surface, there are more creatures doing more things than you can imagine. This freshwater habitat provides water, food, and shelter for the organisms that make this their home. Most pond organisms can be divided into plants or animals. Microscopic plants, such as these algae, form the basis of the food chain in ponds. Microscopic animals eat the algae. Larger plants may emerge near the water's edge, be submerged, or floating. Green plants produce food and oxygen, as well as providing shelter. Just look under a pond lily pad to see what's hiding there. Other animals, such as freshwater mussels, crayfish, and insects are invertebrates, which means they don't have a backbone. Vertebrates do have a backbone and include fish, amphibians like frogs, reptiles such as turtles, birds, these mallards for example, and mammals like otters. Sometimes more than one life stage of an animal may live in or around a pond. Dragonflies, for example, lay their eggs on plants or in the water. The eggs hatch into an immature form called a nymph that lives underwater before changing into an adult dragonfly that flies over the pond. Frogs lay their eggs in the water where they hatch into tadpoles. The tadpole grows legs, loses its tail, and changes from a gill breather to a lung breather so it can hop out of the pond as an adult frog. One other group of pond creatures are the macroinvertebrates, animals without backbones that we can see with the naked eye. We've mentioned dragonfly nymphs, but there are also nymphs and larvae of other insects, like the mosquito, caddisfly, and mayfly, as well as crayfish, snails, worms, and leeches. These are all macroinvertebrates. Because some of these organisms cannot tolerate pollution, the types of macroinvertebrates found in a pond can give us an idea of how healthy the pond is. For example, the mayfly nymph and caddisfly larva don't tolerate pollutants, and the dragonfly nymph and crayfish are only somewhat tolerant, so pond water containing them is a sign of a more healthy pond. Snails and leeches are more tolerant of pollution, so if they're abundant, then the pond is probably not as healthy. Let's look at some of the creatures you can find in Greenland Pond in Brewster. 
Uh, we like to do a lot of different things in ponds. We like to paddle boats, we like to go swimming, but we're not the only ones that live here by the pond. There are many animals that live in and on top of the water, and today we're going to see what we can find in the water. We'll be using a net and a bucket and collecting some animals. Oh look, see all these tiny little fish? There's so many of them. But you notice they're swimming together almost like they're one fish? And that, you know, confuses the bigger predators which might want to eat them. And that helps protect many of these little fish. They're called alewives or river herring. And they in turn eat mackerel and vertebrates, which, as you may recall, are small little but visible animals that live in a pond. They are an important food source for larger animals. When the alewives have grown, they will swim back to the ocean where they will continue to feed on mackerel and vertebrates. But next spring, many will return to the stream, which will lead them to the pond where they were born. Some of the mackerel and vertebrates swim in the open water and have adaptations for swimming. Some crawl on the bottom of the pond. We're looking at the grasses because it's a good place for them to hide. They are well camouflaged there, and some eat the grasses or what's growing on the grasses. Some macro invertebrates are predators that eat other macro invertebrates that are hiding there. It looks like the macro invertebrates that we have collected are very good examples of animals found in a healthy pond. Now that the macro invertebrates have been transferred from the bucket to the pans, the students will take the pans back to their discovery circles to observe characteristics and try to identify the animals. They will need to wait patiently until the animals come out of hiding. This macro invertebrate is a very young crayfish. It's a scavenger eating detritus off the bottom. It is also a predator using its large claws to catch prey. It uses large feathery gills found under the exoskeleton for breathing. This macroinvertebrate is called a whirligig beetle. It uses its large back legs to swim fast in circles and confuses its predators and prey. It has two sets of eyes, one to see above the water and one set to see below. It carries a large bubble of air on the end of its abdomen so that it can breathe under the water. Here we have a dragonfly nymph. It's a macroinvertebrate that lives in the bottom of a pond where it crawls, not swim. It has a big scoop under its mouth called a mandible to scoop up debris. It has pinchers on the scoop to help catch other macroinvertebrates as well. Ah, oh, the giant water bug. This giant water bug can get several times larger than what you see here. It's a fierce predator. Notice the grabbing claws on each side of the head. It uses a piercing needle-like mouth to probe, then inject digestive enzymes into its prey. This animal is called a water boatman. Its middle legs are long and covered with hairs, which allow it to swim very quickly, like a person rowing a boat. As with many of the other macroinvertebrates we've studied, it is darkly colored, which helps it camouflage. This animal is an active predator. Okay, now that we've had a chance to look at our uh, organisms here, they live in the pond, so I think it makes sense that we let them go back to their home. So we're going to put them back in the bucket and then take them down to the pond. Now that we've learned about the creatures that live in the pond and the signs of a healthy pond, let's talk about what we can all do to keep the ponds healthy. We need healthy ponds here on Cape Cod because the ponds are connected to the aquifer from which we draw our drinking water. There needs to be clean water with much dissolved oxygen in it. 
We learned earlier that in order for a pond to be healthy, it needs a variety of native plants and animals. But when plants and animals are brought here from somewhere else and then introduced into the ponds, they can cause damage to the fragile pond ecosystem, making it less productive, less efficient, and unhealthy. Sometimes, materials that flow into ponds from septic systems, fertilized lawns, or road runoff cause ponds to get sick. These forms of pollution can result in algal blooms and fish kills. Pollution is not good for ponds. So, what can you, your friends, and your family do to help ponds stay healthy? Pick up and safely dispose of all trash and litter, no matter where you are. Cut down or stop using lawn and gardening chemicals. Use phosphate-free detergent, soap, and dish cleaner. Maintain your septic system by pumping it regularly and dispose of toxic chemicals properly. Hey there, Sue Sterles again. This time I'm standing at Fisherman's Landing on the western shore of Sheep's Pond, one of the prettiest, largest, and healthiest ponds in Brewster. We hope that you've enjoyed our virtual pond trip and that you've learned something about pond life, pond health, and actions that you and your family members can take to help ponds everywhere stay beautiful and healthy. To learn more, visit the Brewster Ponds Coalition's website. Thank you for watching. Splish splash. That's all folks.